Your local writer's group is crap. Stop burning off your free time in the presence of introverted do-nothings. Instead, join the Goslings Writers Group live stream and podcast, The Goslings, a digital gang for writers. Writers who actually write stuff, who use typewriters, writers who name their pit bulls Hemingway, writers who write all the people who've ever offended them into their stories, then murder the shit out of them, The Goslings. We don't always act pretentious, but when we do, we wear f***ing ascots. Welcome to the Goslings. Right like a man, he's a typewriter. And we're live. Hey, everyone. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Nick. And we're the Goslings. And uh, it's been a while, but we are coming out of the gates. Uh, we haven't done one since uh, December, I think. Happy New Year, huh? Happy New Year, yeah. And we are coming out of the great strong with uh, the man, the myth, the legend, the man. Jedi master of writing himself, <laughs> Stephen Pressfield, round three. How you doing, Steve? Okay, Jonathan. Hi, Nick. How you doing? Hey, great we're to great. see you. Good yeah, to see you. Really well. Um, you want to do the toast with us and we can dive right in? Sure, let's do it. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. Let me, uh, I'll let you start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I start. appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, of course. All right. Take up the broken sword of your father and strike down the darkness. All right. Cheers. Here it goes. Mm. Well, Steve, we have a ton of questions for you, but um, before we get started, um, What's the news on uh, a man at arms? Is it uh, is it out in paperback yet? It's about to come out in paperback. I got the first two boxes from the publisher the other day. It comes out at the end of the month, at March, I think. <clears throat> awesome. So we'll uh, we'll do some kind of a little promotion. I'll sign some books or something like that. But it is coming out in paperback soon, and uh, so that's always fun. You know, it's always cool yeah. to get the paperback thing. Yeah, uh, I know. Yeah. Do you prefer a uh, hardcover or trade paperback or mass market? I What's like your paperback, favorite? actually. I don't know why. I think I grew up on paperbacks. You guys mm -hmm. probably did, too, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, you throw them in the back of your truck, you step on them, you know, and they're still uh -huh. great, you know? I think there was a line from, I think it was War of Art. It was one of your motivational books uh, where uh, you had described uh, the back of your truck during your sort of... <laughs> vagabond years being full of like it's just a typewriter and a truck bed full of molding po uh, paperbacks yeah you know, it's true. like that sounds familiar yeah i like yeah. i like i like the little bricks i like little mass markets you know the real yeah. compact small yeah those are um, cool too. but uh but the paper paperback's great over the hardcover because you can throw it in your backpack and it won't assault you yeah you know if it's if it's like crammed in there yeah. you oh, yeah. feel the corners jabbing into your shoulder yeah. or whatever i always love yeah. trade paperbacks just because like they were they're a little bit you know in between hardback and uh mass market they're a little easier to read them you know mass market but you don't have the dust jacket and it just they're so convenient man so i'm really looking forward to a man at arms uh coming and out and even trade. better are like the advanced copies you know that are paperbacks, yeah. you know but there's they got mistakes in them and everything and Oh yeah, they seem more funky and more real. Uh huh. Yeah, we have that yeah. same thing. Even as, uh, especially as like uh, independent, you know, authors who go through Amazon, we'll order proof copies, you know, for ourselves. <laughs> yeah. And that's my final stage of editing is uh, the proof copy phase. It's proof well, that guys, I, I suck. Thought about this. I got to ask you. I don't want to do this now, but sure. I'm having to crank up my own little publication company with my girlfriend, Diana. Oh, cool. And nice. I may really want to confer with you guys because you've done it. I mean, we've got, like, I'll show you my little board here. Yeah. This is oh, wow. all the stuff that we're trying to, that we've got to put together all of the moving parts, as you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah. would it be okay if I conferred with you on stuff like dealing well, with Amazon and audiobooks and all that kind of stuff? You know, we'll put it under review, Steve. I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, are you kidding of me? Of course. Yeah, my how the turntables have 
turn. <laughs> you, I will. Fl- yeah, I mean, you absolutely. Does that mean that we get to move to California and just like you know live like three miles? We'd down be the, the only and- people in Tennessee <laughs> moving to California. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, really. That's right. No, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and you know, yeah, I'd love to. Nick is uh, Nick is kind of the guru on that. He has kind of he's really mastered, um, or he stayed abreast of a lot of the the marketing stuff and the trends and um, a lot of the back of house technical nuances. Um, oh, that would be great. That would be great, Nick. Thank you. Sure. You know, I'll, I'll yeah. be in touch with you after this at some point. Okay, yeah, cool. That sounds great. Cool. Thank you. Would love that. Of um, course. So speaking of which, we have you for about an hour. Um, we uh, have a ton of questions. We probably will get to half of them, maybe. Mm-hmm. But uh, the first question uh, I had for you was, um, what does the editing process look like for Stephen Pressfield? Uh, that's a, uh, I, I have had the same editor, Sean Coyne, since Gates of Fire, which was in 1998 or something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so basically, he has been my total guru, you know, that I just cool. sort of... Uh, when I when I reach the point with a project where I just can't take it any farther, where I'm getting lost in my head, then uh, oh well, let me go back to the beginning. From yeah. the very minute that I have an idea, I run it past him. You know, with the uh, you know asking him first of all, is it any good? You know, <laughs> are you know would anybody? Is there any commercial prospects for this or whatever? Um, and he will usually give me the okay. Uh, based on, or or he'll direct me in a certain way. Like, um, I, you guys are game for a long answer here. No, that's absolutely. great. Go, please. Yeah. please. Absolutely. I'll give you a longer yeah. answer. Okay. Like, um, when I was, I had the idea to write The Lionsgate, which yeah. was a book about the Six Day War, Israel, the Israel, Arab Israel War mm-hmm. of 1967. Mm-hmm. So I first, uh, I laid that idea on Sean. And the reason I, and I started with it saying that, you know, I've written books about the Spartans, about the Macedonians, the Athenians, but I've never done one about my own people, you know? Yeah. So I really wanted to do it. Plus, it was such a great story, you know? Yeah. He, you know, Israel outnumbered 40 to 1 and in six days won this great victory. So I thought, I asked him, you know, should I do this as fiction? Should I, like, invent, uh, excuse me, here's a phone. I'm yeah, yeah, no problem. Phone. Should I do it as fiction, you know, and create characters, you know? And he said, no, 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 you can't do that. Because there are, uh, the, the war is so recent that there are thousands, tens of thousands of people who fought it, you know? So, and actually it turned out that Herman Wouk, you know, who wrote the Kane Mutiny and, uh, you know, Winds of War, I mean, he wrote a couple of books about the Six Day War as fiction. And uh, I'm sure they did a lot better than mine, but I, when I read them, I thought, this was a mistake. So Sean said to me, you got to do it as narrative nonfiction. Now, I'm, I said to him, what's that? You know, <laughs> this goes to show you what an idiot, you know, I could be after like 30 years of work. So he had to like sort of give me a course in what narrative nonfiction was. And um, what did he cite me? What was that? Uh, Band of Brothers. It was a book and a movie about Mogadishu, about the U.S. forces. Black Hawk Down. Yeah, Black Hawk Down. On... Black Hawk Down, I think. Black Hawk right? Down. Yeah. He yeah. said, Black Hawk Down, that's narrative oh. nonfiction. In other yeah. words, it really happened. It's true. Yeah. It's nonfiction, but it's told as a story so that the the writer interviews everybody that he possibly can mm-hmm. and then shapes it into a story, you know, <laughs> establishes a theme and where does it start? And what's act one? What's act two? Act three? So Sean kind of instructed me, said, that's what you have to do with this book. you got to go to Israel. you got to interview, you know, as many people as you possibly can. Yeah. And then you've got to you've got to shape that raw material into what you think a story is. So that's part of what an editor does, at least for me. Like he actually defined a genre for me that yeah. I was clueless about. Mm-hmm. But in terms of uh, fiction, to keep going with our long our long answer here. Like um, with a man at arms, when I finished the manuscript, I sent it to Sean and he usually sends me back, you know, like a 12 page or 20 pages of notes. But in this case, he went through the whole manuscript with a track changes 
mm-hmm. thing, you know, that yep. thing you do on the side. Yep. And like oh, yeah. we would say, uh, he had like maybe four or five kind of major points that he wanted to make. Really? You know, like there was one character that I had, uh, uh, the character of David. You guys have read the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like the character of David, uh, uh, who was the young boy that follows the hero. Nick's kind of favorite a, character. An apprentice. The boy, yeah. And I had him live at the end, and Sean mm-hmm. said, no, you got to kill him. Yeah. He's got to die at the end. Somebody's got to die at the end. And he kind of cited various, you know, uh, precedents, other stories, other movies. And yeah. he convinced me of that and a few other things, you know. And um, so uh, he gave me, like, th- these four or five points that I that he thought I should change. And then he gave me, line by line, various, th- various you know, comments. And one of the things that was tremendously helpful was... When he came to a part that he really liked, he would praise it, you know, yeah. and he would say, oh, this is great. You, oh, this is a great twist. You got to keep that. And that was very helpful because a lot of times, as you guys know, you have like a scene in a book, right, in heavenly realms or whatever you're working on, where you go, oh, I think this is really good, but maybe it's really bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been there. I got a lot of those, because, Steve. <laughs> because usually those scenes take a risk, right? Yes. Have I gone too far, you know? Yeah. And so left to your own devices, you might over worry and cut it. Yeah. So it was really great that Sean would say to me, no, this is great. Keep this. You got to have the fact, make it bigger. Yeah. So that's basically the, the, way, the way it goes with, with him and okay. me. Um, in some books, he has really sent me back to the drawing board, you know, for like really? another nine months of work, that kind of thing. But wow. in, in the wow. latest one, it wasn't too too bad, but sometimes he has. You know, uh, I've kind of encountered the same thing with Adam, Adam Burrell, our narrator for mm-hmm. the audiobook versions. Mm-hmm. He's kind of he's kind of taken on that role. It really seems like a, a good editor is almost like a, a partner in your walk through the story because it's somebody who you can't just have it be a mercenary who just comes in and finds you know marks Mm -hmm. up so it's got to be somebody who's plugged in who believes in you Mm -hmm. who enjoys the work you know a real multi-layered multi-dimensional you know and i've I've that's hard to find in the self-publishing space it really has been for me how do you guys do you guys have a regular editor that you work with or how do you guys do it i do now with adam uh because he enjoys the work so much i have started to bring him in and pay him to edit the books and then i've started to bring him in in that same level that you do uh with your guy where i sort of bounce ideas off of him and i'm like hey does this work i'm thinking Mm -hmm. about doing this you know and Mm -hmm. more of that creative back of house especially with a series because when it's a when it's a series of novels you know things things have consequences over time so you have to maintain consistency while also having a professional editor right no he's not yeah strangely enough he um he's a narrator he just uh he's in england Mm -hmm. and um he's in bury st edmunds and he sounds like alan rickman you know so he's Uh, yeah Alan Rickman's great yeah yeah Yeah. and he does all these accents and uh he's super cool but um but yeah, I've noticed that like he really has that that gene in him, that vein of just being able to like get plugged in. And he's probably the fourth editor I've I've used mm-hmm. so far. Mm-hmm. So I've gotten lucky. I've been very blessed with mm-hmm. Adam. Um, uh, Nick, you kind of use uh, beta readers, right? I do. Yeah, I use uh, beta readers where I'll I'll write something that I'll send it to a group of people. I won't write the whole thing out. I might write a portion of it. And send it to a group of people to see if they like the direction that it's going. That's always helpful because they're potential, you know, mouthpieces. Once it's ready to be published, they can go out and talk yeah. about it too. Yeah. Uh, but then I also have or had uh, an editor. So once I completed the manuscript and I did all my self edits, I'd send it to to the editor. Yeah. Um, she, she did the first five books, uh, and how do I say this nicely? <laughs> 
she was a different style of. We're, we're legally separated at the moment. Let's put it like that. <laughs> we're going through a separation right now. Well, and, she did uh, mine too, and honestly, it was, it was um, uh, getting a little, a little not a slop. Missed. There were misses. There were things that were getting missed. Uh, and, yeah. and but she wasn't a she wasn't a content editor. She wasn't a developmental editor. Yeah. It was more line editing. Yeah. Uh, you know. Um, you know. Uh, when, I have a book here that I'm sure you guys know. It's by Ryan Holiday called Perennial Seller. I've heard of that. And yeah. uh, apparently Ryan Holiday had or has a company that sort of does editing for people. You know, and he huh. was talking about working with James Altucher and other people and how as writers, you know, where his yeah. company would send them back to the drawing board and stuff. I don't know if he still does that, but... Uh, and I know that there are bunches of, of uh, websites that you can go to where um, that are sort of clearing houses for editors and designers and cover designers and so on and so forth. Because mm -hmm. a lot of, I guess, editors that worked for big five publishing companies now are working remotely or they're working on their own. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, really? I just okay. well do some freelance. Yeah. So, um, that's another source for anybody that's looking for that. Obviously, you have to pay them. Yeah, sure, of course. Oh, yeah. The right person. There are a lot of people that do this freelance. We've had good luck, at least with our covers, uh, with using MyBlart. Mm -hmm. M-I-B-L-A-R-T. Mm -hmm. For covers, yeah. For covers, yeah. They've mm -hmm. uh, very reasonably priced. Uh, Last really? time, yeah, yeah. Uh, they did my fifth one, um, uh, my fifth Heavenly Realms novel, Wayfarers. And they they exceeded my expectations for I mean a very very modest I think what like four hundred dollars for yeah, a cover? something wow. like between, yeah four between four and five hundred which is really surprising the quality of work they do for that amount because in yeah, self publishing wow. it you really do get what you pay for yeah. and when you look at a self published book typically you can identify that it's self published yeah, yeah. because yeah. a lot of them are do it yourselfers and uh, there are some parts of the process I think. You shouldn't do yourself. You should yeah. you should pony Absolutely. up the dough and get yeah. someone to do it for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, I think there was a website you had mentioned last time about uh, editors. That was a pretty good one to fall back on. I'll uh, if if you don't remember it off the top of your head, I'll post uh, or I'll give a link and we'll post it. Maybe below. it's Sean's thing. Storygrid.com. That does sound familiar. Storygrid.com. Yeah. Storygrid yeah. Storygrid I think that. Com. What okay. Sean I think has I'm, done is uh he's my my editor and you know my business partner and he has evolved i guess he's been an editor for maybe 30 years now wow and he has evolved his own system and believe me this system is like nuclear physics <laughs> it's so complicated you know the human mind cannot grasp it you know <laughs> but it's um but he has taught it's called he calls it the story grid and he used uh -huh. to say, let me put the grid on your work, you know, and he yeah. used to terrify me, you know, but, um, <laughs> but he has taught this to a bunch of young editors. He has like a whole kind of school. So mm, cool. if you're looking for an editor, they have a, if you go to storygrid.com, they have a little uh, tab at the bottom, at the top of the screen, it says editing services, and you can find an editor and hire them. Oh, so, so that's cool. a really interesting thing. That's Man. such good information. And folks... There you have it. I mean, <laughs> I know, just right? that alone. <laughs> yeah, that alone can is save solid. You that's so solid much. gold. Thank you for so, sharing that, Steve. Thank you. When I'm you're check that out. when you're done with, um, you know, let's say you're done with the manuscript, and then uh, you send it off to your editor for him to maybe give it a final once over. Do you then get it back? And do you comb through like a, a proof copy? Do you make notes on the page? Do you read it out loud? Like, is there any sort of final? process for you that um that is like the stamp of approval or do you just send it yeah, off and wait for it i mean i just do with the normal sort of thing i you know the i go through <laughs> the manuscript on track changes you know the yeah. last thing is it'll come you know you've already had a copy edited and there's little things fixed mm -hmm. and then i'll just go through it and you know fix a few little things myself but the yeah. big point i think people mistake an editor uh, like new writers, I'm sure you guys have the same experience with people you've talked to, where they think, oh, an editor just fixes the punctuation and, you know, changes the capitalism. But a real editor shapes the whole, the whole thing. Yes. Shapes the yeah. Whole book, yeah. Yeah. You know, and tells you. If you think of a parallel, I think of uh, 
like uh, a band that goes into the studio, right? Mm -hmm. And and they have a producer. Yeah. Right? And you think, um, have you ever read, read, read Bob Dylan's book, Chronicles? Part no. Two or whatever it is. No, but our father was a producer for 50 years. Ah, then mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. Like he yeah. Comes, you think Bob Dylan, he's got like 10 songs and he's got them like on his own guitar, right? Yeah. And maybe he's got a band that kind of comes in and does, but that's not at all what the record's going to sound like. Yeah. Right? That's or like the Beatles, if you think about uh, uh, Pete, what, George Martin was their producer or. Um, for Fleetwood Mac, Lindsey Buckingham was kind of the producer, and mm -hmm. they would give it the sound, right? Yeah. And yeah. so shaping it. There's a huge difference between the song on a guitar or piano yeah. and the final product, you know? Yeah. So oh, yeah. That's what an editor really does. It's really like finding a wife, <laughs> it seems like, in it a is. way, you know? <laughs> it really is. If you've got a great editor, you're halfway home. Yeah, you really are. Man, that's so cool. Uh, I love it. Then that's the type of editor that I've been. That's what I need, <laughs> you know, because I'm I've only, you know, I've just Story started. My, com, that's I am your answer, so baby. relatively new to the, the writing process and getting, you know, a finished workout. And uh, yeah, I need. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to be checking that out because I need an editor to, you know, read through it and say, why is this happening here? Why are you spending too much time talking about X mm -hmm. when you should be maybe focusing on Y? And, yeah. you know, where are you taking me with this? Well, that's the trap. I don't of, get this character. You know, I need those things. The The trap of being a, a novelist, especially, is that it is such a solitary experience. And you can we all can fall into that ego trap of thinking like, OK, well, it's just me. So it's just going to be me. But mm. I mean, making a writing a novel or publishing a novel is a lot like making a movie in that like collaboration can be the key to success and getting outside your own ego and listening yeah. to other people because like, you get smell blind to your own stuff. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So smell blind. Yeah. I like that term. Oh, well, I'm smell blind about everything. <laughs> That's a great title. Um, yeah. What's your next uh, what's your next question? Well, my my question, my next question was going to be how long do you when you're writing something? And it kind of ties into the same thing. How do you know it's done? How do oh, you know yeah. it's how do you know it's ready to see? let's say you get have an idea, you yeah. go to Sean, and he's like, Yes, go with it. You should definitely write that. So you start writing. And how long do you pour over that and you know, kind of poke and prod at it until you feel like it's good to like send it to him officially? How long do you uh, f allow something to simmer? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question, Nick. And like the, uh, um, there's a there's a trap that your own self sabotage, your own resistance with a capital R, yep. will will lead you to, and that is over perfectionism in getting something done. Right? You, it's really ready to go, but you feel compelled to keep noodling with it and keep oh, yeah. rethinking it. And the next thing you know, you've just driven yourself into a corner and you're absolutely crazy. And I'm <laughs> more of a fan of, it's sort of an instinctive choice for me. I just sort of know this has reached the point of diminishing returns. You know, yeah. I'm not, I'm getting confused. I really don't know <laughs> where I'm going. I, I need a, I need help, you know? Like uh, there's a story I tell about, I, I had a, a, my original first editor was, uh, uh, a guy named Bart Fless, and I thought he was like in his 90s when I was working with him, but he was really in his 70s. <laughs> and I remember when it was one book that I was uh, coming near to the end of, and I just kept noodling it. Noodling. I'd never published anything, never published his first one. And, uh, and in fact, we didn't get this one published either. But he <laughs> said to me, where are you on this thing? Where are you? And I said, I'm close, Bart, I'm close. He said, Close is good enough. Give it to yep. me, you know? Yeah. And I think there's a lot <laughs> to be said for that, you know? Yeah. Um, What's close that is phrase? Good enough because the people who are going to read it, like in publishing houses, they're not going to read it that closely. They're going right. to read, you know, and get a sense of, you know, heavenly realms. Oh, this is good. I like the story. I like the characters. A lot of stuff going there. They're not going to really noodle over act three in a transition from act whatever. Right. So mm -hmm. a lot of times close is good enough. Yeah, because okay. as writers, being a solitary profession, we tend to get too much in our own heads 
And honestly, I, I've noticed that too uh, with some of my books. Not many because I'm pretty sloppy, but but like per- <laughs> but perfection really can be the enemy of progress. And it's like, man, it's better to have 85 percent of a plan and do the plan than not do anything because mm-hmm. it's not 100 percent perfect. Yes, you know? I couldn't agree more. Yes, that so. being said, you know the manuscript should have no mistakes at all yeah. in yeah. any, you know. It can, you know, maybe act three is all wrong, but there shouldn't be any typos or anything like that. No. Right. Yeah. And that's uh, by the know, time it goes to the publisher. You mean, after, yeah, you know, after yeah. Although it. they can screw up, too. I've noticed that I found a typo in Dune. Dune. Uh-huh. It's like four. <laughs> it's page four hundred and twenty seven. It's a very modest one. It's one that very clearly they had made some sort of mm-hmm. editorial change. It was mm-hmm. very minor. It's grammatical. Mm-hmm. in nature and uh but it, yeah it was there at dune i mean that's yeah. like one of the icons of you yeah, know yeah yeah that's the thing about you know self-publishing a book is that yeah, it there's is no safety i'm the matter. publisher <laughs> in that scenario it is all on me it is all my fault if there's an yeah. error and you know we published and we found we found typos after the fact after oh, yeah. after combing through it editor going through it, two rounds of solid editing you know, proofreaders, yeah. proofreaders yeah. on top of the beta readers and the editor and yeah. myself edits. And it, we published and one of my readers said, uh, yeah. I got a typo. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Or yeah, what, it what I'll get sometimes from is readers will write in like uh, in um, uh, one of my books was set in Brooklyn. And I had like a car chase and it's going down this street and that street and the other street. And I've been like combing over maps and everything. And uh, a guy who was a reader who's a writer himself, he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, you know, Bumble Strick Avenue is a dead end. You know, you, you guys would have crashed into it, you know, a piano store. Nice. So I, you know, change all that. <laughs> was that the was that the knowledge? Uh, no, it was 36 Righteous Men. Oh, I have that book. I haven't read it yet, but I want to. Yeah, yeah, I got uh, I got the whole Pressfield Library like sitting with all of my other. <laughs> hey, you know, speaking of speaking of your books and books you recommend, last time we talked, you recommend uh, the Movie Goer, and ah. you also recommended me reading the Symposium, mm-hmm. uh, ah. and I was really wanting to read Tides of War, and uh, I said, well, you know what, I'm going to read the Movie Goer first. Steve recommended that book. I'm going to read it. Loved it. Yeah, I thought the ending was great. Yeah, great ending, uh, isn't it? Really great. And, and I had just come back from a trip from Louisiana, New Orleans. And so ah. all these things are still fresh and vivid in my mind. So it really made it come alive even more. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. I'm like, cool. Now I'm going to read the Symposium, the classic. I read Symposium up to the point where Alcibiades comes on the scene. Ah. <laughs> the good part. The best part. <laughs> and I was like, I love this guy. <laughs> I I'm just going to go straight to Tides of War. <laughs> he couldn't and I did. Temptation. I, I haven't finished the symposium. I went oh. straight to Tides of War. I'm about halfway through it. Well, you'll have to <laughs> so, go back to it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that was a good... That's a great... It's such a great scene when Alcibiades appears, you know, drunk. Yeah, and drunk. comes yep. in, you know, amazing. You think like these guys, Plato, writing in, you know, 400 BC, can't really be funny or really tell a vivid story, but boy, they can, you know. It's just oh, like... Yeah. Yeah. They're humans or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, speaking of characters, my second question for you was one that I've often thought of, um, especially given your your pretty colorful background. Um, are there any characters that you have ever put into your stories that were inspired by real people in your life? Uh, that's a that, that's a great question, Jonathan. And what uh, the first three novels that I wrote that never got published that were terrible and deserved to stay in a, in a, the drawer were all based on real people. Really? You know, sort of okay. an ethic for me that you had to tell a true story, otherwise you were cheating, you know? Oh, right, and yeah. At some point, I, just, I vowed to myself, I will never write another story that has a real person in it, and I'll never write anyone that has a character based on me in it, you know? Oh, yeah. And, and that until like the knowledge, let's say, but yeah. that was 30 years later. And that was very liberating for me to do that. I said, I'm just writing pure fiction from now on. I'm making everything up. Yeah. So no, I have not, but a lot of people do, but yeah. uh, I want to show you one thing while we're, we're talking about the movie goer and Walker yeah. Percy. Yeah. I, uh, I, I might've told you guys this story, but uh, 
I had a dream. Walker Percy is this amazing writer that wrote The Movie Goer and, and lived in New Orleans and was a, a doctor, a medical doctor, wrote a bunch of other great stuff. The Movie Goer won the National Book Award for Fiction, I think, in 1962. So I had a dream where I had, uh, I was reading a, a, a book and there was a passage by Walker Percy. Did I tell you guys this story? I think, I think so. Does it involve a letter? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and tell I, woke it up, I remembered the dream and I wrote it to him a letter and Ooh. I quoted what he had written. And I said, you know, it was like a paragraph. And yeah. I said, don't blame me if this is shit because I didn't write it. You did. So he, wrote, <laughs> he wrote me back and I, I found it. This is, this that's is a letter. The, he wrote me back. Wow. Uh, man, and, that's cool. Uh, here even is, here, here's the, even the, uh, a note, and it's just to show you how people are a little different. Oh, wow, David. look at that! And he said, Come on, buy the house, you know, come by, we'll have a drink, and blah blah blah. And unfortunately, <laughs> he died before I could take him up on it. <laughs> yeah, what a, what a great guy to send a thing to, you know, that somebody so cool. send him a, you know, a crazy note. How old were you when you wrote that? How old? Yeah. Uh, 28, something like okay. that. Okay. Yeah, that uh, that makes me feel a little bit less self conscious about all the emails I was writing, Steve, in like two thousand five, two thousand six, <laughs> and, and just walls of text. And like, Steve, you're so generous. You know, I please do not do this now. Steve is far too busy for the, you know. But uh, but he would write me back, and yeah. uh, you know, and, and those were like I saved all of those. That's awesome, dude. Gates of Fire. It's my favorite book of yeah. all time. It's so cool. So like, yeah. I mean, if you had asked me twenty years ago, like. You know, hey, you might get to you might get to like interview Stephen Pressfield. I'd be like, whatever. Yeah. No. You know. But yeah, here we are. So. And that kind of ties in. That ties into one question. Uh, yeah. that, and a lot of I I know this about you, but a lot of people might not know. Uh, what are some things that when you sit down to write, you're overcoming. You're kind of summoning the muse. <clears throat> And there are items you have actual things unique things that oh, are special to you from sparta yeah what are some of those things and is that letter one of those things that you keep Your near totems. you totems yeah when you're writing talk about that a little talismans bit. well i do have a bunch of little things though you know i i don't want to i won't show it to you but over right over there is my i have a little altar of various items that uh, i consider to be lucky like one is a an acorn from the battlefield at thermopylae but yeah. another one is a yeah. this little cannon that a, a friend of mine gave me from, uh, I don't know if you can see it, yeah. from uh, Morro Castle in Cuba. And I always point it at me when I'm writing so it can fire inspiration into me. Um, I love it. But, awesome. You know, it's so it's such a mysterious process that you just yeah. need all the crazy shit you can find. It. Uh -huh. you any kind of any sort of talisman that you can glom onto, you know, having, you know, Walker Percy's letter here is just a great thing to have around. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm definitely a believer in superstition. I would pick up pennies off the ground, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's sort of like a, a, a all-star baseball player with his lucky socks. Yeah. yeah it's like, exactly. does it make sense? No, but you know what? Uh, the, the numinous, the Mysterian, you know, the logos, none of it makes sense. That's, that's yeah. the fate of yeah. you know just whatever that is that's beyond us you yeah know? i mean look, um, you guys with your typewriter thing i mean i got my lucky yeah. typewriter here i know i don't that's use awesome. it yeah i have it there yeah <clears throat> yeah and wouldn't cool. just having it close it's yeah. that it's you got that some of those energy. things too you oh some yeah. Of those things. I've yeah seen some of those things yeah i got i got my little reliquary you yeah. know <laughs> of all my little totems and talismans and yep. things from vacations and trips you know we took a uh, my, our dad and my mom and, um, our younger brother, uh, and I, we got to go to Prague in 2005, mm -hmm. I think 2006. Um, and, uh, cause he, the string players over there, dad would do orchestra sessions and the string players over there are, it's cheaper to fly him over there and pay them. And they're better than the people here mm -hmm. than it is to use the union people here anyways. You know. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. So we got yeah. to spend four or five days in Prague and I filled up a notepad of ideas for a book <clears throat> that um, is almost completed. Um, only been working on it for 17 years now <laughs> uh, about a blind mercenary hoplite after the Peloponnesian war. 
you know, oh, just wow. his experiences, but just being in that European city with the cobblestone and the cathedrals and the mm -hmm. hustle and bustle of people and the, the bazaars and the mm -hmm. crowds with all the different languages, it just, you know, but you get little totems and talismans like uh, I got a, um, uh, a golem from the Jewish quarter when I was uh -huh. there, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I set that there. It's part of my my little, you know, mm -hmm. collection. Mm -hmm. And uh, and every time I look at that, I just start remembering things from Prague, you know, that's that, neat. Yeah. That's neat. So um, <clears throat> so I got a tough question for you. Um, and I wrote this down very specifically. Resistance knows our kryptonite. What is yours? <laughs> uh that's that's a great question. Um, you can plead the fifth if you want. I don't know if I really have like a real you know kryptonite kryptonite, but the way that resistance can, can really fool me a lot of times is it will come up with legitimate reasons yeah. why I should slough off. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, some reasons you can just see through. Oh, that's bullshit. You know. But sometimes they'll say, you know, your your brother is in is in a little bit of a bind. He really needs some help. You better go, you know, drive up there and talk to him. And that and that'll be legitimate, you know, be yeah. a real deal. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, so that's that's tricky, you Man. know. That's tricky it's sort to navigate of, those things. It's yeah. sort of like but I don't even, have like a real kryptonite. I shouldn't say that because it'll now happen. Yeah, know. well, knock on wood, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Um. Well, that's uh, that's the insidious nature of evil, man. Is that like even the devil knows how to quote scripture, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah, yeah, boy, that's great, Nick. <clears throat> I mean, it, it can use Jonathan. it can use the truth. So, I uh, for for me, this it it changed for me. It, really, <laughs> it comes in different forms, but yeah, like this week, it's been the news. It's been the news this oh, week. Oh, sure, yeah, with you all know? the stuff going on. Yeah, uh, I cannot thing. pull that's my head. That's out. legitimate. Yeah. It's legitimate, relevant. And, and it could impact us. It could impact you know? us. It, it will next time you need to get gas. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> we were going to ask. Yeah. Uh, we were going to get your thoughts on that, Steve. Uh, we can point, we can do but, that later because I know there yeah. are other writing related questions, but yeah, I would sure. like to ask that. some questions about that at some point, if that's OK. Sure. So, OK. Uh, my next one, let's see, which one do I want to go with? Uh, Steve, it's, it's sad. I provided 12 questions just on my side and Nick had like Nick six more. Three. Know, so yeah. you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Really so, thin, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll I, literally get to like a third of, I actually, <laughs> so there's, there's a friend of mine, uh, named Dave and, uh, Dave is also a big fan of you, a big fan of your, your books. And he wanted to know if you, uh, if there ever might be something on the horizon where you write, you're writing a story about, I mean, a man of arms, it happens during the Roman empire. Yeah. Right. The, yeah. the, the emergence century. of Christianity, mm -hmm. right. First century Rome. Have you ever thought about writing a story uh, that is, uh, th that focuses on like a, a recognizable historic Roman figure in the Roman empire? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I, I have not, but your friend's name is Dave. Dave, yeah. Sometimes I have found when people ask me if I've ever thought about writing about such and such, and I bet you guys have yeah. found this too. It's really they, Dave. He's the he one. He should write that book. Yeah. yeah. That's his form of resistance. Yeah. He has an impulse uh -huh. to write this book, and his form of resistance is, well, I'm not good enough to do this. Let me ask a, an established writer. You know, it could be me, could be anybody. Yeah. So I usually say when people uh, approach me on something, I say, you should write it. And yeah. a lot of times people will immediately respond and say, well, you know, you're right. I really should. I really am. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, I think yeah. that that was what I would say. No, I haven't really thought about that. I just uh, maybe I should, but I haven't thought about that. No. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there are plenty of characters, to, plenty of historical figures to go around. Did you ever read... Uh, I think you did because I think I know about it because of you. Wallace Bream's Eagle in the Snow. Yes. About General Maximus on the Rhine. Yeah. Yeah. And that is that is like I always considered that the Roman equivalent to Gates of Fire. Like uh, those two books. I actually have it here and I usually do don't really? have people's books. In fact, I'm looking at it right now. Oh, I no kidding. Thought, uh, that's it's just such a great book. I just wanted to, you know, keep it yeah. on the shelf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's uh, yeah, for anybody who, you know, and they, they really actually cribbed a fair amount of, uh, of material from, I, uh, from that, I think for the movie gladiator, it, it was part of the matrix, you know, cause the general is named Maximus and he's fighting the, the Gauls or the, or the Germanic tribes on the Rhine. Yeah. If, uh, if anybody, yeah. if anybody likes gates of fire, but you want like the Roman version of that, Wallace Bream's Eagle in the Snow. Mm. It is. It is a yeah, cool a great one. Yeah, definitely. Book. And, it, and it's got a great drama to it. So, and it's it's kind of hard to read in a, a little good bit. sense. You yeah. know, in a good sense that like you feel like this is so real. Yeah. I've really got to focus and bring my great my reader's attention to this because it's so you know it's so true. This this guy this writer really did a job on this. And he I did. Just have to get it with it. Get with the program. Yeah, that was uh that was something that I really noticed. He he got the industrious when they're building all the fortifications and they're reinforcing and rebuilding all the towers along the perimeter. You really get that industrious nature of uh, of the Roman mindset of like let yeah, nothing yeah. go to waste. You know, it's mm. very uh very left brain, very mechanical. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, I feel the same way about uh, about your Greek fiction as well. Gates of Fire, Tides of War, especially Virtues of War. You know, you have um, <clears throat> you have such an artistic and elevated uh, vernacular and diction to those. It really every time I read those books, I was learning new words, you know, but not in a not in a frustrating Me too. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I tell everybody uh, after like 80 I like pages and reliquary. That was a great one. You just pulled that right oh, out the top of your head. You see, he does this all the time. He's got this vocabulary on tap. Yeah, it's I don't know how he does it. I'm useless at parties. It shames me. Let me tell you. <laughs> so, um, did you have another one, or is it my turn? No, it's your turn. It's my turn. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll do. Uh huh. I'm just trying to figure out if I want to. So do many one. good ones. Um. Okay. Yeah. What is your? So this is something that I, I often uh, wonder about. Uh, about you know seasoned professional successful writers. What is your favorite? and least favorite stages of writing stages yeah hmm. ah that's a that's a great one um i think it's it's great fun i'm sure you guys will agree with me when you just have the idea and you're sort of fleshing it out yeah. you just have a, a little sort of a kernel of it but you don't <laughs> have the whole thing and it is kind of great fun to because then you don't have to really get into is this going to work or not you know you're just trying <laughs> but, to yeah you know um, I do that. That's the, my favorite part because I do that with my kids because I write kids books. So I'm uh, flushing the idea out with them and they uh, throw ideas that are so fun to play with. Uh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, that that part is definitely. And then at the very end, when you've kind of broken the back of something and you're just sort of polishing it, yeah. then that's kind of fun. You know that the day is not going to be a turn into a horror show, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but the middle the middle passage as David Mamet always calls it yeah. is, that's the hard part when you're out of sight of land you know and uh -huh. yet you haven't seen a drift in a sea of blood you know you just got a slog through and you don't know what the hell you're doing you know then it's really hard I think that's uh I think I picked up the phrase it's one hell of a slog from Pressfield's books, I think, <laughs> and I use it in like every single one of my books, you know, uh, yet it is that it's always that middle portion, you know, um, like with the first Heavenly Realms book, the first act plays out like a movie. It's pretty simple. The third act is the war. So it's just a series of battles and events that happen. But it's like, how do you marry them together in that middle portion? And that's mm. that's the minds of Moria. You know, that's mm. the abyss. That's mm -hmm. the it's so mm -hmm. tough navigating through that, you know, but you keep going one foot in front of the other, man. Yeah. You know? so. I mean, I've certainly seen this uh, or heard this in athletics as well. In fact, I was I don't know what I was watching inside the NFL or something like that, where they were talking about the middle part of a season, you know? Yeah. It's like, as you get towards the Super Bowl, it gets in the playoffs, yeah. it gets exciting, you know? But in the middle, you know, it's like, <sighs> oh, no, crying. we've got like this stretch of seven games. We got a yeah. five-game road trip, you know? We're going to get our asses kicked. You know, we got to keep going. <laughs> it's a you know, grind. we're injured. Guys have got tweaked hamstrings. And, yeah. You know, and that's really, you know, it's a grind, I think, 
everywhere like that you know yeah it really is mm. you know i was listening to um your uh your war of art mini series uh that you can sign up for on your website uh, -huh. uh the little 10 minute 10 12 minute mini sort of podcast interviews uh -huh. that uh with your editor, I think. Is that right? Yeah, that's with Sean. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, everybody should sign up for that. That is yeah. so much fun. Yeah. It's so cool to listen to. And um, I remember I was listening to one last night where you were talking about marathon runners hitting the wall at like mile uh, yeah. 22. You know, have you ever and that's, you know, of course, that's right on the cusp of being done, you know, with a marathon. Have you ever experienced that wall towards the end? Have you ever can I run uh, into just that? Just about every one, I think, Jonathan. Really? Every, every one, you know? Yeah. You, it's just, I think it's almost universal. And, it, you know, if we were remodeling a kitchen, yeah, you know, there's going to be that moment, you know, we go, oh, no, I can't, you know, I just ran out of gas. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. I think that's the lesson that I was trying, or the principle I was trying to impart was just that uh, that moment of hitting the wall is going to come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bank on it. It's going to happen. Yeah. So yeah. you just have to be ready for it mentally mm -hmm. and just say, okay, this is the wall. I knew it was coming. Yeah. <laughs> and let's just dig in and, you know, grind our way through it. There's no other way. There was, um, I'll see if I can pull it up in time <clears throat> just because I want to make sure I get the quote right. Uh, there's this beautiful part in that, uh, in that podcast where you talked about, um, you talked about resistance and it was it was the most it was the most inspiring thing I'd heard in a, in a long time uh, because it's so motivational. Uh, you had said resistance always appears second. It is the shadow of the oak tree, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. a manifestation of our dreams and our aspirations. Uh, but the shadow never appears unless there is the tree. So it's well, like it's definitely, definitely true. You know, it's definitely yeah. true. It is heartening to think about that you know yeah. that uh, yeah. um, resistance the negative force comes like a newtonian reaction yeah you know the equal mm -hmm. and opposite force to a dream you know like if if we have an, an, an idea for a book or a startup or anything like that immediately it will produce a shadow yeah it's like a tree in a meadow but the, but the tree comes first the yeah. dream comes first. There wouldn't be a shadow if there weren't a dream. So in many ways, the fact that there is a shadow is a good sign yeah. because it shows you that there is a tree. And the bigger the shadow, the bigger the tree. So yes. in a way, it's it's inspirational. If, mm. uh, if you're really feeling some horrible negative emotion about something you're working on, that's a good sign. Yeah. Because it wouldn't be negative if it wasn't something some dream there that resistance was trying to stop you from uh, realizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go where the fear is. Mm -hmm. What yeah. is it? Uh, uh, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil mm -hmm. for you are with me. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's no, there's no shadow over the valley if there isn't a mountain to climb. Mm -hmm. And at the top of the mountain is the sunrise, man. You know, what's scarier than walking through the valley of the shadow of death. What's that? Just standing there. <laughs> yeah. And not walking. moving. Yeah. You know, you got to do your part. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. God helps those who help themselves. Yeah. And it's one of those things that, you know, you talk about the valley of the shadow. That is not a comfortable place no, to be, not. you know, when you're when I. If you feel like everything is on autopilot and it's comfortable. Yeah. And you're going to that's when you're going to hit the wall and or you're going to have to decide, am I have, am I willing to just move forward in my discomfort? Yeah. Yeah. Because what is it? Uh, the hell the hell of change has to be less painful than the hell of staying where you are. Is that, that's about, yeah, I'm butchering that quote. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, it's yeah. The, or the idea that <clears throat> the pain of doing it now yeah. is nothing compared to the pain of regret later on. Oh, having yeah. not done it. Cause that will, that rubber band stretches. So the uh, longer you wait, man, the more that, oh, that slap yeah. hurts when yeah. it, you know, yeah. Um, this is getting philosophical. I well, I got uh, I got that quote that I use in all like it's probably in every Heavenly Realms book, but they always talk about you know we we wander in the valley, you know, um, in the shadow of the valley, lighting brush fires when we should be looking to the constellations. Mm. You know, and it's uh, like you can you can get to those like little steps. You can get 10, 20, you know, 
-hmm. furlongs ahead in the valley by lighting brush fires mm. that show you a little way, but you need to be aiming higher, you know, mm. and, uh, and that's how you, that's how you get to the mountain, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's, that's good. Muse. That's good. So you got that'll, pre one. that'll preach, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know you were going to show up for church today. Yeah, man, come yeah. on now. Come on. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I do have another question. Yeah. So, and, uh, cause I'm not familiar with traditional publishing, but my question for you, but I think a lot of people would be interested in knowing this. Um, when you have an idea, sometimes you'll fish that idea out to Sean to see if it's worth pursuing. Um, let's say he says, go with it. You write it, it gets edited, and then it's ready to go to the editor. Typically in that process, from what I understand, and I could be totally wrong about this, there is a, uh, you know, a synopsis of the book that uh that you you know a proposal a book proposal that then goes to the publisher you know a couple of pages about the book you know why it's relevant what other books it's like so forth is that something that you write yourself does sean write that or how do you uh, how do you do that that's a great question again i never even knew about this either this is here's my experience and it might not be everybody's for fiction there is no book proposal because the the um, publisher can't really decide if it's right or if it's good or bad until they see the whole thing. It's only for nonfiction that you do a book proposal. And I never knew this. Actually, Sean had to kind of teach me this. We were talking before about writing The Lion's Gate, which was narrative nonfiction. Mm -hmm. That for that, I did have to do a book proposal. And and I think they're usually like 50 pages long. And sort of like what you're describing, Nick, where you kind of say, here's the premise, here's the, your, it's a pitch, it's really a pitch to the publisher. Yeah. Here's yeah. the market, you know, this, these people will, enjoy, you know, it'd be like for a, uh, a Malcolm Gladwell book, like the tipping point, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. he'll say, uh, here's the theme, you know, it's about blah, blah, blah. And he'll say, here's the market, it'll be for, um, you know, the intellectual people who like to read big idea nonfiction and bump it, bump it, bump it. Um, and then based on that, a publisher will will uh, uh, issue an advance. You know, here's whatever amount of money, go write the book. Yeah. But um, which is what happened with the Lion's Gate. I, I you know, I uh, I did uh, I did a, a proposal and it was accepted. And uh, and they gave an advance. And it, it sort of the interesting thing on this was we were all wrong. The thing about the Lion's Gate was it's, you know, since it's a story about the, the Israeli victory, I sort of said the market for this is going to be American Jews. Mm -hmm. They're going to love to read the story of Moshe Dayan, of the yeah. Jewish fighter pilots, the Jewish tank commanders. They're going to yeah. love it, you know. And the publisher said, wow, you're right. This is so true. This is great. This... And then when the book actually came out, that was the audience that resisted it the most. Really? Hated it the most. Yeah. And I, and the reason I think, I'm just guessing, but it's absolutely true that they, they resisted it. I think American Jews, and I'm one of them, although I don't feel this way, have this thing about Israel that they now think like Israel is sort of like it's getting uh, um, tarred as an apartheid state. The the uh, Israeli army, a bunch of stormtroopers with their heels pressed on the necks of the wonderful Palestinians. Mm -hmm. In other words, American Jews are so liberal that they're yeah. like against Israel, you know? Interesting. So when this book, you know, was really praising the Israeli military establishment and showing the heroism and bumping up and all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. American Jews didn't like it. And so, in, in other words, it's, this is sort of a sidebar to your question. Nick. The bottom line yeah. was we were all wrong. The pitch I made was wrong. Yeah. And, and, and then fortunately, the publisher <laughs> agreed with it and, and uh, gave me an advance. <laughs> but so that's how the, uh, a, um, a book proposal is done. And there are services out there that can help you do a book proposal. And there are books that will teach you how to do it. And there are people that will sort of be coaches. So if anybody needs to do yeah. a book proposal, um, they you can get help doing that. Cool. Uh, for me, it was Sean who just taught me. 
Yeah. Because he, but for fiction, in my experience, you have to write the whole damn thing. Wow. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. You know Which makes who? Sense, right. Think of the sure. ending of the movie goer. Right. How mm-hmm. could you? How could you uh, do that in a synopsis? No. Yeah. Chance, no. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Too emotionally complex for them to really yeah. get why that's a special ending. Having written synopses and proposals and outlines back when I was trying to get traditionally published, none of the emotional complexity comes through in any. Yeah, of it's, that. Impo- it's really and it's that's a, the meat. like a, je- a, a experience of hell. I think trying to write these things. Oh, it yeah. is. Yeah, it's so brutal. Yeah, because yeah. how do you condense? How do you condense all that? Yeah, I, absolutely. <laughs> how, would oh, you, how would you condense Game of Thrones? <laughs> right, oh, right. And, and do justice. Yeah. To it? No, yeah. No. yeah, you can't. Yeah. By the way, the on the um, other hand, on the other hand, if you were making a proposal for a book like Moneyball, mm-hmm. are, you, are you familiar with that? You know, it's yeah, like yeah, how yeah. yeah. The came into Major League Baseball. You can yeah. do that. You yeah. know, you could describe it, and if you and I are publishers, we go, "Oh, that makes a lot of sense. I can see how the readers would like that, and that would be fun." Yeah. Mm-hmm. I bet you. Um, I don't know. You might want to verify the numbers um, as far as sales for uh, for the book on the Six Day War, the Lions Gate. I bet you um, our people, Southern conservative Christians, are probably one of the biggest demographics of buyers. You're right book. on target, Jonathan. That's yep. exactly yeah. it. Yep, conservative yeah. Christians. If you read this, the only way I know this is to read the reviews on Amazon. Oh and yeah, you get a review that'll say something like. I'm not a Jew myself, but I've always kind of admired the state. I know I read this book. I was really inspired by them. And it'll be signed, you know, Bogalusa, Louisiana, you know, so yeah. you're, <laughs> so I think you're exactly right. Yep. And yeah. nobody predicted that. Yep. No, no. Uh, so well, they should have talked to us first. We did. Yeah, yeah, we did. American conservative Christians love Israel. Yeah. They, they love typically Israel. are pretty pro yeah. Israel. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. it's it's intrinsic to our you know to our religion yeah, to yeah. the Bible and you yeah. know uh, Christian uh, Christian Zionism is uh, it's a very big thing yeah, in, big. in the Southern it's Church big. in the Bible Belt. Yeah. Yep, so, for sure, yeah. for sure. My uh, my friend Dave that I mentioned earlier, by the way, his favorite book is The Lionsgate. Oh really? Yeah, he made oh, sure that I knew right. that right out of the shoot. <laughs> oh, that's funny. He's like, yeah, that's my favorite book of Pressfields. <laughs> He's read everything, but that's his favorite. So. so we have a ton more questions, but we only have a few more minutes. Want to be very respectful of your time and very grateful for it. Um, I know Nick has one more question. Mm-hmm. I have a very funny question that I want to ask you. Um, okay. When it comes time, Steve, can I write your biography? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. No. <laughs> and there you awesome. go. <laughs> awesome, fair. <laughs> Not the answer I was hoping for, but the answer I was expecting. <laughs> right, right, right. Fair enough. My question was more along the lines of current events, and uh, you know, like I said this week, uh, my my kryptonite uh, that the uh, that resistance has been pressing its my sore spot. It's been pressing its thumb down on has been the news, yeah, uh, and the horrible headlines i wrote uh read thursday morning yeah uh and wanted to interested to know what your thoughts on the situation is with ukraine and russia uh especially given your study of history and how you've implemented that in in your books i know you've done a lot of research but you're familiar with war you're familiar with the outcome i'd like to know what are people going to be writing about 50 years from now about this Oh, that's a good. That's a great question. I mean, I'm just really rooting for the civilians and the Ukrainian army that are somehow. You know, if you're, I'm sure you guys have been watching the videos that have yeah. come out. You know, on yeah. it's never on the real news. I don't know what's wrong with the real news. It's only you know like people posting on crazy sites. But Instagram, uh, Instagram's a good source for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Twitter too. Twitter yeah. too. Yeah. But I'm certainly on their side, and I'm just. I'm, I'm sort of praying that these are not just isolated, cherry picked stories of, you know, one Russian convoy that gets hits with RPGs and gets stopped, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and while meanwhile, the juggernaut is rolling on. Um, uh, but, you know, we just it, it's so hard to know what's really happening over there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it really it'll is. Take time to come out. I mean, I, I sort of put myself in the position of like one of these young Russian soldiers yeah. and that they have to invade. And I would imagine that their feeling is a lot like Americans being sent into Vietnam. Like okay. what the fuck is going on here? You know, <laughs> yeah. I want to die, you yeah. know, 
the Ukrainians are like our brothers, basically, mm -hmm. right? And they're standing up and we've got a, I can't believe anybody's got any real enthusiasm going yeah. in there. I think mm -hmm. it's probably a death trap. What a place to die, you know, terrible place yeah. to die. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I hope this is a complete debacle for Putin and <laughs> that the whole thing blows up in his face. And, um yeah. So I'm not sure if that's answering yeah. your question. No, no, but no, that's great. That's great. Well, you know, there's I'm, a little bit of precedent for that because uh, the Ukrainians launched a counteroffensive a couple of days ago. Yeah. And struck uh, into Russian territory. They did. They like hit an airbase, yeah. Yeah. a Russian airbase. Yeah. Oh, which did I they? saw that. I was mm -hmm. like, hmm, I mean, there's going to be a lot of fantastic stories coming out of this. Hope, we don't know how it's going to end. Yeah. Might make a I good. Know Supposedly, our intelligence services and Europeans are are sharing, you know, real time satellite intelligence. Like, you know, there's a column coming down, you know, this highway, a Russian column, yeah. and you can head them off at such and such a place, you know, uh, or whatever. Yeah. I, I'm really fascinated to hear those stories. Yeah. I'm sure there are all kinds of of uh, you know vets and hardcore contractor type of dudes on our on our side mm -hmm. that are heading over there as fast as they can get there to help yeah. any way they can. Yeah, and, a friend of my a but, friend of my wife's uh, has a son who uh, served he was born in Ukraine. Oh. Uh, and then they moved over here when he was 3. Uh, he grew up here, American citizen, served in the Marines. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he's out of the Marines now, but he's he's trying to get over there to go fight. Yeah. He's like that's where I was born, it's my homeland. I got to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people are going to do that, I think. Yeah. What's what's your take on this, Nick? What's what's uh, what do you think? Well, it's hard. Like you said, it's hard to know what to believe. I mean, you have the mainstream media with nobody trusts any facet of the mainstream media anymore. You know, you don't know if you can. Uh, and so you just pick up what you can. But what, I do like some of the stories coming out for me. I, it's interesting to see the UK, Ukrainian president staying there. Yeah. yeah, he's great, isn't he? What a, he's made a name for himself with this. He and he was an nice. actor producer. Before. Yeah, yeah. He made a movie <laughs> about a TV show uh, or a TV show about being president of Ukraine. Yeah, and then after that, he became, became president. president of Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, but I like that. Um, I like that he's being visible. He's on the front lines there. He's kind of leading from the front. He's keeping spirits high or trying to keep spirits high. And I loved that. I love two things about this guy that I like. One, he's one of four. Uh, excuse me. He's the grandson of uh, uh, one of four brothers, three of which were killed by the Nazis. Oh, okay. His uh, grandfather, he's a Jewish Ukrainian. His grandfather's uh -huh. a Jewish Ukrainian. He was the only brother left wow. that didn't get killed during World War II, and his grandson ends up being the president of Ukraine. Uh, and so here this guy is. He's the president now. And my, which I, for me, that's just, that's really cool, great kind of backstory to him. But what I like most about him is when uh, Biden offered to send some of our forces into Ukraine as an evacuation, we asked, do you want us to come mm -hmm. evacuate oh, yeah. you? And his response, the Ukrainian president Zelensky, his response was, we need, I need ammunition, not a ride. Yeah. Uh, I need ammo. Yeah. That's, that's great. That's a great one. That's, that's got balls, like, baby. You know, it's big. You got to carry him over your shoulder right yeah, there. That's yeah. how big his, you know, what's are. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Well, Steve, um, we could go on for another hour, but I want to be very conscientious of your time. Well, so we'll save it for another time, Jonathan. Yeah, that yeah. I great. Know. We we Love literally it. didn't even get halfway through our questions. I had, <laughs> I had so many about like you know what's your what's your favorite part of Virtues of War? Like which philosopher is your favorite? You know whatever all this stuff. So uh, Stephen Pressfield, the author of A Man at Arms, yep. which is going to be out in paperback at the end of March. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, a Man at Arms is uh, a beautiful and powerful book made for the silver screen. Reads like a movie. It's uh, takes place in the first century AD. It's absolutely fantastic. Everybody should read it. Uh, Stephen, you're you're renowned. You're a household name for the War of Art. You're near and dear to our hearts for Gates mm -hmm. of Fire. Yep. Uh, do the work. No one wants to read your shit. I mean, the list mm -hmm. goes on and on. You really are the Jedi yep. Master of writing. Yep. <laughs> we yep. are the humble Padawans. We are the who, Padawans. <laughs> who, are, who are happy to move a stone, you know? So uh, we always enjoy it. Thank yeah, you, Yeah, thank you, Steve. We, we, hey, we it's great enjoy. hanging out with you goslings. And you too. Toast with you. So anytime. And I will awesome. be in touch with you for some advice on... Uh, yeah. You know, starting my own little uh, yeah. publishing business. Man, that is Absolutely. exciting. We'll be happy that to help That is exciting. You. Right. Well, I'll 
I'll tell you, I'll whatever I however I can help. Yeah, you great. Say the Thanks, word. Steve. I'm in. You bet. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys, and thanks to everybody that's listening. Absolutely. Right. Bye, Steve. Bye, Take Steve. Care.